song is Jesus Loves Me. That one comes in a close second. I'm thankful for the cross, thankful for the Lord, thankful for His grace. Jenny, thank you for sharing that song with us, and I wanted to share with all of you that um, her husband Mike will be sharing with us in some of our Sunday night services next month in the month of May about um, what Muslims believe as uh, they ministered to that people for a number of years. And so we'll be talking about that. I encourage you to come out on our Sunday nights and, and be a part of learning because you probably, if you don't know, uh, you probably have a neighbor who is Muslim or somebody who is considering converting over to that faith. And uh, just as they're living in darkness, everyone who's without Christ is living in darkness. So you don't even have to be a Muslim to live in darkness. Uh, you can, all you have to do is just not believe, and uh, you're living in darkness. Uh, Prophet Isaiah said the people who were walking in darkness have seen a great light. And that's what I pray would happen in this place this morning, that we would see a great light. Take your Bibles and let's look at John chapter 13 this morning, or I'm sorry, John chapter 14. We finished John chapter 13 last week. We're in John chapter 14 this morning. The very first verse, our subject today is the cure for heart trouble. You know, I was thinking about that. If somebody could come up with a cure for heart trouble, you would be rich beyond measure. Did you know that 25% of all deaths that take place are attributed to some form of heart disease? 25%, one in four people will die as a direct result of some heart disease. Some of you here today, maybe you're under a doctor's care for some heart condition that you have. Maybe you're taking medicine for that this morning. Wouldn't it be wonderful if somebody came up with a cure? Now, I'm not talking about a surgery procedure. I'm not talking about some program where you exercise or you lose weight. I'm, not talking, I'm talking about a pill. Wouldn't it be awesome if somebody came up with a pill and you would take that pill and boom, the blockage in your artery was gone. Wouldn't that be awesome? Or maybe a shot. You went to the doctor and you got a shot and boom, the damage from that heart attack you had was reversed. Boy, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? Well, you know, as terrible as heart disease is, there's something that's even worse. 25% of people die from heart disease. 100% of the population in the world is affected by spiritual heart disease. Every person, 100% of our entire world population, that includes all of us, we suffer from spiritual heart disease. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Matthew chapter 15, the Lord Jesus said, Out of the heart of man proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, and blasphemies, we indeed are all terminally ill with spiritual heart disease. On May the 2nd, 1960, Dr. Robert Goetz and his medical team performed the first successful bypass surgery. I was reading about that. Uh, the patient that they operated on only lived a year. And that doesn't sound like much with what we know today, but back then, that was amazing. He had a year that he didn't have. 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus, the great physician, he brought about the cure for spiritual heart disease. <laughs> the prophet Ezekiel describes it this way in Ezekiel chapter 36. The Lord says, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will take away your heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. That's what Jesus accomplished on his cross. That's what he can do in your life if you'll trust him, if you'll believe, if you'll have faith. Beginning in the previous chapter, John chapter 13, is Jesus' last discourse. He begins to kind of give his final talk with his disciples. It begins in the upper room at that last supper. And we saw last week about how 
Jesus, during that last supper, he showed his disciples that he loved them by washing their feet, and then he began to tell them again that he was leaving, that he was going away. And the disciples naturally were upset. They were upset, and we're going to see in chapter 14 just how upset they were. We're going to read that they were troubled. There's that word, troubled. Have you ever been troubled? Has someone ever troubled you? Has something ever troubled you? As, as great as our country is, as much stuff as we have, as much money as our nation possesses, I think we are full of some of the most troubled people in the world. People are troubled. The good news is that Jesus can minister to you in your time of trouble. Jesus can work in your life in the time of your trouble and your turmoil. So let's look at what Jesus had to say to his disciples. Look at verse 1, and I want you to notice, first of all, the remedy for a troubled heart. The remedy for a troubled heart. Jesus has a remedy. Let's look at it. In verse 1 we read, Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Let's pray. Father, open our eyes and our heart and our mind that we can receive and understand what you have for us today. And lead us where you would have us to go. And do it all for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when you go to the doctor, what's the first thing you do? <laughs> the first thing that you do is you wait. <laughs> I mean, after all, what do they call the room there? They call it a waiting room, right? So, you wait. The second thing you do when you go to the doctor is you wait. Because they move you from the waiting room to the exam room, which is really nothing more than a waiting room. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? You've been to the doctor. You, you, know, you know this is true. Eventually, the doctor comes into the second waiting room, and he doesn't stay there, she doesn't stay there very long, because there's others that have been waiting. And so you get, you know, three, four, five minutes. Maybe you're, if you're lucky, you get 10, or you get 15 minutes with your doctor. And then your doctor leaves, and after your exam, you go and you wait to check out. And you usually leave the doctor's office with a prescription of some sort. And so you take your prescription to the pharmacy where you wait. <laughs> I get the idea, you know, is that <laughs> waiting is just kind of part of life, isn't it? But I want us to think about that prescription that you walk away from the doctor with. What's a prescription? What is that? Well, uh, the word prescription comes from the word prescribe. A prescription is a noun. Prescribe is a verb. And the word prescribe means to order something or to, to authorize something. And your doctor writes out this prescription, and when he does that, when she does that, it's an order from your doctor for the pharmacist to do something, to put together a, a, a medicine or a treatment or something that is designed to, to help you or to, to heal you. The prescription authorizes the pharmacist to do something. It gives the pharmacist the authority to fill your medicine order. Now, the disciples we read in verse 1 were afflicted with a troubled heart. They had troubled hearts. They were suffering from that. They were heartbroken. About what? They were heartbroken that Jesus said, I'm getting ready to leave you. And, and not only were they heartbroken, but they were confused by that. They couldn't understand it. They couldn't get, why was Jesus getting ready to, we've come so far. We're, we're like right there. Why is he getting ready to leave now? Jesus had a prescription for their troubled hearts. And you know, that, that shouldn't be a surprise, should it? I mean, after all, Jesus is the great physician. You would think that the great physician would have a great prescription, and so let's look at it for just a little bit. What is the Lord's prescription for a troubled heart? What is the Lord's prescription for your troubled heart? 
Notice that there's two parts to it. Verse 1, we read, Let not your heart be troubled. The first part is to reject your trouble. That's the first part of the prescription. Reject your trouble. Let not your heart be troubled. That's a command. It's a command from the Lord. So since he's given us a command, do you think it would be smart to do it? Sure it would. It would be wise to do that. But you're thinking, now, reject your trouble. That doesn't help me a whole lot. I, I don't quite get that. I mean, are you, are you saying that I want to be troubled? Explain to me. What, what was Jesus saying here? I, I think what Jesus was telling his disciples could be summarized in one word, and it's this word, remember. Remember. Remember what you've seen. Remember what you've heard. Remember what you've been taught. Remember what you have personally experienced in your life. Because you see, when Jesus told his disciples to do that, everything that they had seen, everything they'd heard, everything that they had been taught, everything that they had experienced pointed to the fact that Jesus is God. And that Jesus is our Savior. Everything that Jesus did in his life and ministry pointed to that. The miracles that he did proved that. The words he spoke gave evidence of that. Jesus is just telling his disciples, don't be troubled. Remember. And you know, when you remember that Jesus is God, and you remember that Jesus is your Savior, your troubles may not go away, but they tend to get smaller. They, they tend to pale in comparison to Jesus. And that's the whole point. Jesus is God. He is Lord over your trouble. He is Lord over your circumstances. He is Lord over your situations in your life. But you still have to make the decision to not be troubled. Now the word troubled, we've come across this word before. Not just this morning, but this word troubled, we look back in John chapter 13, verse 21, where we saw that Jesus' heart became troubled. Now that's kind of surprising that God himself would become troubled. You remember the Hebrew word? It's sara. Remember we talked about that earlier? The Greek word for troubled is the word terasso. It's a verb. And, and this Verb literally means to have your life stirred up. It's a picture of the waters of Bethesda. You remember that story where Jesus went down to the waters of Bethesda, the pool of Bethesda? There was a man there who had been crippled for most of his life. And he was complaining because every time the waters got stirred up, every time the waters became troubled, is what he was saying, somebody would beat him into the water. He couldn't get there first. And so... There was no way he was going to get healed. He was overcome by his trouble. His life looked hopeless. The word troubled describes mental turmoil. It talks about spiritual anguish in your life. And this is what Jesus was experiencing. Jesus was troubled by the, uh, the imminent arrival of the cross. The cross was just hours away for Jesus. He was troubled by that. Jesus was troubled by the thought of becoming sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. You see, Jesus had never experienced that. We were talking about that in Sunday school this morning. How from before the beginning of time, eternity passed, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit existed in perfect fellowship. And when Jesus bore the sin of the world, that was the only time where that fellowship was jeopardized, where it was broken for a second as God the Father turned away from God the Son because he couldn't look upon sin. And Jesus experienced what we, what we understand, what it is to be separated from God. You see, the Isaiah 59 verse 2 says, Your sins have separated you from your God and have created this expanse such that he can't hear you. Jesus came to do something about that. And he did it. He did it. Jesus was troubled by the thought of bearing our sin. He was troubled by the thought that his friends would betray him. One in particular, Judas. He would, be, he would sell him out. Jesus was troubled by that. Jesus was troubled by 
the thought, the understanding of what was going to happen to Judas before the day was out. That troubled him. You know, there are some people, you maybe are one of them, maybe you know somebody, who struggle with trouble. They struggle with, we call it depression. And it's a real deal. If you've ever had it, you understand that. If you know somebody who has it, you understand that. There are people who struggle with depression and they need help. They need help from doctors. They need help from medicines and treatments. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here in Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. Jesus was talking about the turmoil that comes when your life is troubled. He's talking about what happens when you live life. Because you see, in the process of living life, you're going to be troubled. Trouble will come your way. If you're not troubled right now, praise the Lord. Because guess what's coming? It's not far around the corner. Trouble will come. Let not your heart be troubled. You know, strangely enough, in our world today, there are people that actually enjoy trouble. That's weird, isn't it? You maybe know somebody. Now, they, don't, they don't necessarily like the trouble. They don't like the feeling that comes with it. But here's what they like. They like the attention that trouble in their life gives. They, they like people to notice that, oh, bless her heart. What a poor man. Oh, he's had so much trouble in his life. They, they kind of like being recognized and, and treated by people like that. But folks, this is not mind over matter. And then this is not the, the power of positive thinking. What Jesus is saying here, let not your heart be troubled, is the power of God. It's the power of His Word. Let not your heart be troubled. Truth never changes. God's Word never changes. Jesus never changes because He's truth. And the truth of who Jesus is causes the truth of your trouble to pale. It may not go away. But Jesus is much bigger. Reject your trouble. That's the first part of that prescription. Notice the second part. Look at verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Reject your trouble. The second part is trust Jesus. Reject your trouble is a command. Guess what trust Jesus is? That's a command too. <laughs> believe in me, he says. Jesus says, believe in me. You believe in God, believe in me. Most of the Jews back then believed in God. There are some today that believe in God. But every one of those Jews who believed in, in God had never seen God. In fact, you remember what God told Moses? You can't see me. The moment you do, you'll die. No one can see me and live. That's what God said. Jesus is saying, you've never seen God, but you believe in him. I'm standing right before you. Believe in me. Trust in me. Jesus assured his disciples in the midst of their wavering faith. Now, they had believed in him. And we read earlier that their belief was saving belief. They, they trusted Christ and they were saved. But Jesus noticed that their faith was starting to waver. And it was wavering over this truth that, hey, I'm getting ready to leave you. It's what Jesus said. Their, their faith started to waver. And Jesus assured his disciples that you're going to need the same kind of faith that you had when you can't see me that you have right now when you can see me. I'm going away. You're going to need the same kind of faith when I'm gone that you have right now while I'm here. Does that describe our faith? You ever seen Jesus? You ever seen God? Maybe you've seen him at work. None of us have ever seen physically seen Jesus, but yet we believe. In fact, Jesus will tell Thomas later, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's the kind of faith that you possess today in Jesus if you've trusted him. You've never seen him, but you still believe. You, you've never held his hand, but you, yet you trust him. And that's the kind of faith Jesus is calling us to embrace. Reject your trouble and trust Jesus in the midst of your trouble. That's the prescription. Pretty simple, isn't it? And guess what? The best part about that? You don't have to pay a copay. <laughs> it doesn't cost you 20 bucks. It doesn't cost you 200 bucks. It's free. All you have to do is reach out and take a hold of it. That's what faith is all about. Taking a hold of God's grace. By grace, you're saved through faith. 
Grace is God's free gift. It happens when he gives you faith to believe. And when all of that comes together in your life, the Bible says, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the prescription. Look at the, uh, the provision. Verse 2. In my father's house are many mansions. Wow. If it was not so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. When are people troubled? I mean, we're troubled in all different times in our lives, but I think when death comes into your circle, that's when people are troubled greatly. Death is the great troubler. Death is certainly a time when our hearts are troubled. Well, how many times I've shared this passage at a funeral. Jesus told his disciples to remember and then to continue to believe in him, especially when they were in trouble. Jesus also told his disciples to consider what he was going to provide for them. So what was Jesus going to do? Look at verse 2. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Jesus said, I'm going away, but I'm going away for a purpose, for a reason. I'm taking a trip, but there's a reason behind it. Jesus was going away to prepare a place for his disciples to live. Now notice what this is described as. In verse 2, Jesus describes this place as my father's house. Do you see it? My father's house. The word house there is another word for heaven. So think about heaven for just a minute. Heaven is described as a country. Why? Because it's big. Heaven is described as a city because there's a lot of people that live there. If you've ever been to the city, you understand that. Heaven is described as a kingdom. Why? Because it has a king. And this king is Jesus. King Jesus. He's the king over his kingdom. Heaven is also called paradise because it's a place of indescribable beauty. We were talking this morning earlier about how the music in heaven is just so wonderful, but yet it can't be described I think there's colors in heaven that John shares with us in John chapter 20 about what heaven looks like. And he couldn't really come up with the color because he'd never seen it before. But it, it's kind of like red. It's kind of like yellow. It's kind of like blue. But it's really not. It's gloriously beautiful. Heaven's also called a place of rest. Well, I like thinking about that, don't you? Heaven, heaven is a place where there's no sin. There's no tempter. Now, there's no conflict. Heaven is a place where Republicans and Democrats can come together. <laughs> Heaven is a place where we're going to be able to rest. Now notice in verse 2, Jesus points out for us something about God's house. Do you see it there? In my Father's house are many mansions. That's what the King James says. The NIV calls it rooms. The New American Standard, the Holman Christian Standard, calls it many dwelling places. So whether it's many mansions or many rooms or many dwelling places, we're still talking about heaven. We're talking about my Father's house. We're talking about what Jesus is describing here. The, the word is oika, and that's the Greek word for house. In my Father's house are many houses, is literally what this verse is saying. Now that doesn't really kind of makes sense, does it? But let's try to figure out what is it that Jesus is saying here to, to us. In my Father's house are many houses or many rooms or many dwelling places. Well, we need to understand what was going on in the, the life that Jesus lived in that time, in the Jewish family, in the Jewish community of Jesus' day. In that day, when a son had grown old enough to get married and to start a family, that son didn't move out of the Father's house. Many of us can relate to that today too, can't we? <laughs> he didn't move out. What did the father do? The father simply added on to his house. And he didn't build rooms onto his house so that his son could have his own house, where he could have his own family, where he could have his own children. But it was all connected to the house, to the father's house. What happened to the daughter? The daughter would marry somebody else's son who had a, a house of his own, and the daughter would move to that family, to that husband's house, and become part of that family. And guess what happened after that? The son, when he had children, who got old enough to get married, and 
he would add on to his house. And, and, and it just kind of kept going. And so this whole idea here about the father's house, the father's house became an intimate family community. It became a place where multi-generations of people lived. From the grandfather down to the grandchildren, great-grandfather, great-grandchildren, multi-generations of people lived in the father's house. Now, I don't know what these many mansions, these many dwelling places are going to look like. Uh, you, you all have heard the song, I have a mansion just over the hilltop, right in that great land where... And one day yonder, you know, we'll never more wander, but what we're going to do, walk the streets that are purest gold. I, that's a great song to sing. I remember singing that as a kid. I'm not so sure that that's really the way it's going to be. And I'm not so sure, I'm, I don't think it's going to be, uh, everyone's going to be given a closet to live in. I don't think we're all going to be living in micro apartments somewhere. And uh, for those of you who are claustrophobic, that's a relief, isn't it? <laughs> but I do know this, whatever it is, it's going to be beautiful. Whatever it is, it's going to be glorious. Whatever it is, it's going to be wonderful. Why? Because it's big? No. I think it's going to be wonderful because of who's there. Jesus really isn't talking about the size of the dwelling place, being a mansion or whatever you want to call it. He's talking about the fellowship that's going to take place in my Father's house. And that's what's going to make heaven wonderful. It's not that you're going to have this huge mansion to live in, but that you're going to be living with Jesus. Wow. That you're going to be living around God's people, and we're going to have glorious, wonderful, intimate fellowship with God and with his children all of the time. And so that's why I tell you right now, you might as well come on out and be a part of all the fellowship activities, the dinners, the things that we do together, the, the ways that we work and minister together. Get to know one another because guess what we're going to be doing for an awful long time? We're going to be in fellowship with one another. We ought to just go ahead and start practicing right now, shouldn't we? And I invite you to be a part of all of that. This is the kind of place that Jesus right now is preparing for you, if you know him as your Savior. This is the kind of place, the kind of work that Jesus is doing right now. And if you're a born-again believer today, Jesus is building you a home. He's building you a dwelling place just for you, specifically for you. Now, why is Jesus going away to prepare a place? I'm glad you asked that question. Notice the promise there that we see in verse 3. I'm going away to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Why? So that where I am, there you may be also. Jesus went away to prepare a place because he promised that he'd come again. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. Notice that he didn't say, I might come again, or I'll think about coming again. He said, I will. That's a promise. It's a guarantee. And folks, Jesus is coming again. He's coming for his people. Jesus here in verse 3 is talking about the rapture. He's not talking about the second coming. Make sure that you understand there's, there's a difference between the two. Those are two separate events. Jesus is talking about the rapture. Now, how do you know that, Mike? Notice what he doesn't mention in verse 3. Jesus makes no mention of coming in judgment. He's just coming simply to take his people. When Jesus returns for his church at the rapture, He's returning in the anticipation and the celebration of being reunited with his disciples, with you and me, not just the 12, but you and me as well. When Jesus comes back at his second return, at his second coming, he's coming back on a white horse as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and as the judge over heaven and earth. And there he will judge heaven and earth at his second coming. But here Jesus is talking about the rapture. Now, when will the rapture take place? Boy, there's been people that have been talking about that for centuries now. There have been folks that have been bold enough to even guess a date. And I would tell you, I don't know when the rapture is going to happen. And I would tell you this, if anybody tells you when the rapture is going to happen, it's a guarantee it's not going to happen there. Because no one knows. Jesus said even himself that he didn't know the date of his return. 
Only the Father knows that. Over the years, theologians have developed opinions about this, this rapture thing, and they've always tied it to, to the tribulation. You probably have heard these terms, the, the pre-tribulation rapture. Have you ever heard that? Well, there's, there's two others. There's one called the mid-tribulation rapture, and then there's one called the post-tribulation rapture. And, and guess what? All of those are self-explanatory. You know, the pre-tribulation rapture, in, in that belief, it says that the rapture takes place when? Before the tribulation. So guess what happens in the mid-tribulation rapture? The belief is that it happens in the middle part, halfway between uh, the tribulation. The post-tribulation rapture would say that it happens at the, at the end of the tribulation. And guess what? Every one of those can be supported by Scripture. Every one of those, somebody can hang their hat on a verse. So what do you think, Mike? I almost hesitate to tell you. But I will just go ahead and tell you, I think, for me personally, I think pre-tribulation rapture is what Scripture speaks of. Now, I like to think of that, not just because I really don't want to be here for the tribulation, and I imagine that none of you want to be here for it either. If you want to be here for the tribulation, talk to me afterwards, because we need to do some, some, uh, some, we need to do some exploring in your life here. But I think that the Scriptures do talk about God's people being saved from judgment. You can look in Revelation and see that. You can look in, in uh, the Gospel of Matthew. You can, you can see Jesus talking about that, that, that once we're saved, that we've been, we, we've, uh, we've been removed from judgment because Jesus bore our judgment. So you're not going to have to bear judgment because Jesus already did it for you. Praise the Lord, yes? Amen. Amen. But what's important is not if it's pre-trib or mid-trib or post-trib. That, that's not important. If for some reason it's not pre-trib and we're stuck here, guess what? God will give us the grace to somehow either get through it or endure it or something. That's not really what's most important. What's most important is that Jesus promised he's coming again. He promised it. And because he promised it, nobody can change that. And nothing can change that. Jesus is going to come again. He's going to return. And the question this morning is, are you ready for that? Are you ready for Jesus to return? If he was to return right now, well, he didn't. How about this afternoon? Are you ready? Are you ready for him? Notice that Jesus assured his disciples of one more thing. Verse 4, look at this very quickly with me. Jesus said, and where I go, you know. And the way, you know. Now, what's Jesus saying here? Well, uh, you, you remember with me that on several occasions, Jesus told his disciples, we're going down to Jerusalem, and when we get to Jerusalem, the religious leaders are going to reject me, that I'm going to be crucified, but I'm going to rise again on the third day. Jesus told his disciples that. And he didn't tell them just once, he told them several times. They had heard it. That's why Jesus said in verse 4, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> He said here, where I go, you know, because I've told you. And the latter part of that, and the way you know. Why? Because I told you. The disciples heard this. They knew where he was going. They knew the pathway that would lead him to where he was going, but they didn't get it. They didn't understand. And we're going to see in the next passage that they're not going to understand until much later when the Holy Spirit comes and actually explains it to them. They didn't get it. So many people today don't get it. Many in our world have never gotten it. The people who are walking in darkness, oh, we pray that they would see a great light. But the truth is that many today are walking in darkness. And you would say, are you kidding me? We live in America. We live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. And we live in a Christian society. And, we, and it goes on and on. Even in America, people are walking in darkness. They need to see a great light. They need to hear truth. Maybe you're walking in darkness this morning. Let me tell you what the truth is. None of us are good. And all of us have sinned. And we've all fallen short of the glory of God. What does that mean? That means that all of us have sinned and none of us are perfect, but God is. 
We've fallen short of that. Let me tell you what else the Bible says. The wages of sin is death. The moment that you became a sinner, guess when that happened? The moment you were born. In fact, it was before that. Even David said, I was conceived in sin. We, we were born dead. That's weird, isn't it? But we were born dead in our trespasses and sins because the wages of sin is death. We were born as a sinner. So we were born under a death sentence. And I'm glad that there's, there's not a, a period there at the end of that because it's a comma. And then there's the word but. <laughs> we were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. That whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God to us is eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what we celebrate at Easter. That's what we should celebrate every day. We should celebrate the cross of Christ every day. We should celebrate the empty tomb every day. And we should, as believers, celebrate that today might be the day that Jesus returns. Okay, Mike, so I get it. I'm a sinner. Uh, I'm under a death sentence. I deserve hell. That's where I'm going unless I believe. But how, how does all of this get fixed? How does this get fixed? Well, it got fixed the moment that Jesus died on the cross because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. You see, for hundreds of years, the, the Jews would bring sacrifices to the temple and they would offer these blood sacrifices as the, in the shedding of blood for, uh, for the forgiveness of their sins, looking forward to a day when the Lamb of God would come, the Lord Jesus, and He would shed His blood as the final offering made for sin. Jesus offered up His life. He shed His blood on that cross. He did it willingly in order to pay the wages of our sin. You see, somebody had to pay it. And that means one day, you're going to have to pay the wages of your sin, or you're going to have to find somebody to pay it for you. The wages of sin is death. Guess what the payment is? You'll pay with your life. Somebody else paid with his life. Jesus took your place, and he paid with his life. He gave his life on the cross in your place to pay your wages of sin. And now Jesus simply says, would you just come and believe? Remember. Remember what you've seen. Remember what you've heard. Remember what you've read. Remember what you've been taught. The Bible says we are saved by grace through faith. Not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. We're not saved by our works, the Bible says, so that none of us can boast in anything that we've done to be saved because none of us can save ourselves. Only God can save. And the good news is that Jesus did it. Like the hymn said, Jesus paid it all. And because Jesus paid it all, guess what we owe him? All to him I owe. How do I get saved? The Bible says if you will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be, you will be, not you might be, but you will be saved. So what does that mean? When you say with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you're saying Jesus is Lord, He is Master, He is the one who has control, He is the one who rules over everything, and it's not me. And I recognize that. And I surrender what I've been trying to control to Jesus. I've been trying to control my life. I've been trying to control my, my salvation by thinking I could be good enough. But now I recognize I cannot be because Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart. The word believe there means to have confidence in. And that's the word for faith. Believe in your heart, what? That God raised Jesus from the dead. When he died on the cross, he paid the wages of your sin. When he rose from the dead, he rose victoriously to prove that he is Lord over death. And so it's simply to come to Jesus in your own spirit, maybe just silently just say something like, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Just like you said, I agree with you. And I know that I'm dead in my sins. And I know that I deserve hell. And I know that one day I'll be punished unless I believe. And I believe. I know that you love me. You proved it. And I come and I trust you. Take my life today, Lord. I surrender it to you. Be Lord over my life. Please forgive me of my sins. Save me and make me part of your family.
Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're saved, would you rejoice this morning? But if you're not saved, would you be willing to trust Jesus today? If you're saved, are you walking with the Lord? Or are you living in trouble? <laughs> you see that even Christians can live with troubled hearts. Troubled hearts really are kind of an evidence that you're not walking closely with the Lord. You're not being reminded that He is Lord over your trouble. Maybe today you would just thank the Lord, first of all, for being saved, but then would you say, Lord, I'm so sorry I've been trying to deal with my life the way I have been. You're still Lord, and I just renew that commitment to you today. And I give you this trouble. Only you can handle it. Please forgive me for trying to do it. Maybe that would be your decision this morning. Maybe there's something else. Would you make your decision for Christ today? Would you pray with me right now? Every head bowed in this place. Every eye closed. Nobody looking around. Let's just be quiet for just a minute. Just a second. Listen. Do you hear that voice? Do you hear that still, small voice? That's the Holy Spirit.